continue our series regarding the glory of the latter house. So this is our series and this is our last topic for the series. And today I would like to share with you, pray to sustain God's reigning glory. So when we talk about the glory, I have shared for the last several weeks that the glory of the Lord in the Old Testament is only contained in the tabernacle of God made by human hands, especially during the time of King Solomon when he created a huge, magnificent temple. And the glory of God came upon that place. But because of Israelites' rebellion, pride, arrogance, apathy, idolatry, and becoming more self-centered, the glory departed. And many times over, they were under the power of different empires. And every time they came to the Lord and asked God's blessing, they repented, they... they uh, humbled themselves before God. God restored them. After the restoration, several years of peace, blessings, then Israel returned to their old ways. They set aside the laws of God and they walk in their own ways. So the cycle is like that. They will rebel before the Lord. Then punishment will come. They will ask the Lord's restoration. God will restore them. Several years after that, they will return to their old ways. Then they will ask God's uh, restoration again. Then the, God will restore them. After many years, they will return to their old ways. So their spiritual life is up and down. And that is not God's will. The good thing is that God is always forgiving and God is always loving. Amen? Now, what is the connection of this? To pray, pray to sustain God's reigning glory. Let us pray for a while. Father, we thank you. We just ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher for today and speak into our heart. And we thank you for the opportunity to study the word. Bless everyone and let your name be exalted. We give you praise and glory. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this is our text for today. The Bible says in Haggai chapter 1 verse 8, Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build a house and I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. So if you are going to study the background of that, the reason why God gave such a powerful verse, because Israelites were already concentrated again on their own, for their own sake, for their own future. They love to build their career. They love to build their houses. They love to gather much, and yet they came little. And that's the reason why if you're going to read the whole chapter of Haggai chapter 1, God told them, you gather, you try to gather so much and yet you produce little. You try to save so much and yet it seems you didn't save anything. It's like your savings, there's a hole underneath and you're putting it nowhere. So the Bible is very clear when God spoke to them that they need to consider their ways. And considering their ways, they need to realize that more than taking care of their career, more than taking care of their houses, they need to take care also the house of the Lord. They need to rebuild the house of God. So now the steps were necessary for the nation of Israel, since the temple lay in ruins, and they would need lumber, they need woods to begin the process of rebuilding it, because Israel, Jerusalem during that time was devastated, 
not by super typhoon, but by war. So God speaks through Haggai to tell the people to climb the mountain, cut down the trees, bring the wood down, and then reveal God's house. Now, first thing we'd like to see here is this. Go up to the mountains. Why mountain? So what is the spiritual significance of a mountain? Mountains are mentioned in the Bible many times because mountains created the landscape of biblical regions. So mountains have a significant symbolic value in the Bible and they are part of the physical reality of the Bible. Mountains, hills, valleys, they are very important. But at the same time, everything has its own spiritual significance. So mountains have a logical, religious symbolism. Especially within their culture. Because for them, when you are, if you are in the mountain, if you can stay in the mountain, it means you are closer to God. That is their cultural perception. So the more you go up higher for them, the more you become closer to God. So that's why they choose mountains. So they believe that God dwell in heavens and since they can't reach heaven, so that tallest place is like a mountain. So they go there and experience the presence of God as far as their cultural perception is concerned. So no wonder in the Philippines there are some cultic group they go to the mountains during Easter. They go to different high places and put some sacrifices and incense to get more agreements and anting and things or power, you know. But you have to understand that the Ten Commandments was given by God to Moses at Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is a symbol of God's covenant with Israel. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 20, the mountain top was a meeting place with God. Mount Zion is the location of the Jerusalem temple. In Mark and in book of Luke, Jesus appoints the 12 disciples on a mountain. Matthew has six significant spiritual mountain scenes and experiences. Jesus' temptation was held at the mountain in Matthew chapter 4. The Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. That's why it was called the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus performed and demonstrated healing, signs, wonders, and miracles in mountain villages. The transfiguration happened in a mountain. And Jesus' final discourse and even the commissioning of the apostles took place in a mountain. So the most significant mountain seen in the gospel, however, is the transfiguration of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is accompanied by Moses and Elijah. Now, these Israelites, they love to go to mountains because for them, it's a spiritual experience. And Jesus spent his final day walking to a mountain to die on the cross. So the Calvary is also a mountain. So going up to the mountain demonstrates one thing. Go up to the mountain means commitment to complete the job. So in all undertaking, in everything that these disciples, even the prophets of God, they need to go up to the mountain and going up to the mountain takes commitment because it's not easy, it's hard. So if you are going to use that physically, going up to the mountain, if you are not physically fit, you're going to have a problem. But if you have, 
If you are physically fit, of course, using your exercise and everything, you can go up to the mountain. Spiritually speaking, if you are not spiritually fit, it will be hard for you to experience more the mountain experience before the presence of the living God. Amen? Go up to the mountain means commitment to complete the job. You have to go up to the mountain, get something out of that mountain and bring down all the timbers, not illegal loggings. Bring down the timbers and build my house. So go up to the mountain. Don't you know that Jesus Christ wept up into the mountain apart to pray? And when the evening was come, he was there alone. Jesus loved to go to the mountain to pray. I told you it's their, that's their cultural perception. Many times in the New Testament, Jesus always went by himself to a certain place called mountain to commune with the Father. And that was his commitment. And he completed this job. Because if you don't have commitment, it will be impossible for you to complete your job. The same thing what happened to Elijah. It was at Mount Horeb that Elijah heard that still small voice of God. Cultural perception that God can speak to them through a mountain. Now, what is the connection of that? We don't have much mountain here. So throughout the scripture, we see men going up to the mountain to get alone, to pray to God, to enter into his presence and to be encouraged. This is the first step in our rebuilding process because commitment, something that you need to be, to be completed, the first thing in order for you to experience a mountain God divine experience is your prayer life. The only way to go up to the, our spiritual mountain is through our prayer. Don't you know that your prayer is very, very important when it comes to your relationship with God? Hello, are you with me? We need to pray. Tell to your neighbor, you need to pray. And we must spend time praying. We must spend time praying, pouring out our heart before God. In this generation of ours, you don't need to go in a, in, in a physical mountain. Why? For security reason. <laughs> Maybe for health reason. Sometimes, you know, if you are afraid to go by yourself, you don't want to go there by yourself. So, our commitment now is through our prayer to complete our job. And there are two reasons why we need to pray. First, when we pray, we are renewed in our spirit. And that's their cultural perception. Every time to go to the mountain, and pray to God, they experience the presence of God and they are being renewed. Don't you know every time you go to your spiritual mountain, every time you go to a place where you can have the time with God, you are being renewed in your spirit. Why? Because from Monday up to Saturday, you've been through a lot. Many struggles and problems and trials and so on and so forth. Amen? Amen. Don't raise your hand. How many of you, you've been like through hell? It's like, wow, it's too much already. Where I can lay my heart, where I can, you know, put my body so tired. But the Bible says, 
Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of God's Almighty. Amen? When you are tired, yes, come on, let's give the Lord a clap of praise, yes. Go into the presence of God as we enter into a time of communion with our Creator. We discover our spirit soaring with praise, our mental attitude being transformed, and our faith growing. It is during those times of prayer when we are encouraged and when we feel God's peace and rest filling us. You know deep inside of your heart that you can face another problem. You can face another trouble. You can face another adversity. You can face another challenge. You can face all kinds of things. Why? Because deep inside of your heart, you know somebody lives in you, giving you the strength, giving you the stamina, giving you the power to move forward and go on because Christ in you, the hope of glory. If the people of the Old Testament are looking for the glory of God through the temple made by men, now by the grace of God in our generation, we are no longer looking for the temple made by men because we are already the temple of God. And the Spirit of God lives in us. And the only way to activate that is to be in the presence of the Lord, to pray. And that is our commitment to complete our job, having that kind of relationship with Him. Hallelujah. Amen. And when we pray, God will respond to us. And sometimes it's hard to accept the reality of life. Sometimes we have so many questions. But out of so many questions laid down at the feet of Jesus and rest upon his place, upon his presence. Because this is the mystery and difficult for us to understand. How the mighty ruler of the universe would not only listen to our feeble requests, but would also be releasing his blessings every time. Imagine the glory of the latter house is greater than the former one. If they are looking for the glory of God in the temple, now we are looking for the presence of God deep inside of our heart. Imagine that during the time God wanted his temple be clean in order and everything is fine so that the glory of God will come and, and take all their incense, uh, incense and, and their sacrifices. But now it's different. Imagine we have so many mistakes, sins, transgressions, iniquities, and shortcomings. And now here, the moment you accept Jesus Christ, the moment you let Jesus Christ be Lord and Savior of your life, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the God who made everything, the God who loves us, now is willing and able to live and reside in our heart and willing to do anything and greater than what we expect. He is the God who loves us, and He is the God who is willing to do something great for every one of us. Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible says in James 5, 16, the prayer of the righteous man is powerful and effective. Do you believe that your prayer is powerful and effective? Now, there's a big question. The Bible says the prayer of the righteous man. Now, do you believe you're a righteous person? And sometimes we have a big question. Yeah, amen. But at the back of your mind, still hard to understand that. Am I righteous? I just said freaking words this morning. I just said lots of swearing this morning. I swear to my father, to my dad, to my friends. And even, even Facebook, you know. Even though God doesn't want you to dwell in those kind of things because God is not finished with you, don't dwell and don't practice and don't exercise, but instead put in your mind you are the righteousness of God not because you are good, but because God is good. It's because of Jesus lives in you. Amen? See, there's a big difference. For the 
Old Testament people, they need to do all kinds of uh, traditional way, all kinds of uh, spiritual performance in order for them to be accepted. But here, the Bible says, if you confess your sin, God is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all of your unrighteousness. You don't need to bring pigeon doves here in this church. Because I have no plan to uh, make business about poultry, whatever. You don't need to bring cows, whatever, goats. What we need to do is bring our heart before the Lord and surrender it to God. Lord, I made mistake again. Wow, God cleanse me. Holy Spirit cleanse me. And that's the reason why we need to come to our, to go to our mountain and pray and seek God. See, the good thing about God, God did not condemn us. And God has no intention to condemn us. His all intention is to cleanse us and make us pure and holy and acceptable before His eyes. See what happened. Sometimes it's hard for them to accept that God is the God who can answer our prayers. During the time that Peter preached the gospel, praise God, he was apprehended by the authorities and put in a prison cell. So all the church, underground church, learned that. And they rallied the people to pray hard for Peter. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without what? Ceasing of the church unto God for him. So when they heard about what happened to Peter, they prayed without ceasing. And you know this story. Yes, an angel of the Lord sent by God to release Peter. And Peter went to a church, a house church, and knocked on the door. And when the, the lady heard the voice of Peter, she was afraid. She thought, it was a, it's a ghost. And she ran to the group praying and said, I think the ghost of Peter is outside. They have no idea. God answered their prayers. Church, don't be shy when your prayer is being answered by the Lord. In the last days, the Bible declared that God is going to pour out his power and his spirit. God is going to answer the prayers of his people. Not for our own glory, but for the glory of God to manifest his power. That there is God who is in control of every situation. People who don't believe in God, they will have some kind of turnaround. Because God is going to demonstrate his power in the last days. And God is going to use those faithful people who are willing to pay the price. For their commitment is high and strong. And that is the resolve to complete the job. Amen. Imagine what happened. Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. He was also a human being and yet there is power in his prayer. There was a prophecy in our land. That a great disease will go into struck Pangasinan. To strike Pangasinan. We don't know. But one thing we know, if the prayer, if the church will pray seriously, if the church will humble themselves, as the Bible declared in 2 Chronicles 7 14, if my people, which is the church, the believers, the followers of Christ, if my people will humble themselves, consider their ways, if my people will seek my face, if my people will turn from their wicked ways, then I, the Lord who made the heavens and the earth, then I, the Lord who is watching the, the, my people, then I, the Lord, will heal my land. Then I, the Lord, will do great things in my land. But you need to come to that kind of situation. We need to gather and come together and pray and ask, not for our own sake, but for the sake of others. And this is our 
um, challenges to everyone. Our senior pastor in the Philippines gave us this letter that all churches in the Philippines under Jesus Reigns Ministries and all our churches in the 24 countries were going to gather to come and repent and ask the Lord's divine intervention on November 30. That will be Saturday. So if you have time at 3 o'clock here, come, let's come together and pray and seek God's face, not for our own sake, but for the sake of our nation. Hallelujah. Elijah was the same as we are. He prayed earnestly, and God answered. The Bible says, nothing is impossible with God. Amen? Go up to the mountain. Seek the presence of God. Don't seek the temple made by man. Because you are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. The glory of God lives in you. God himself lives in you. So don't let the spirit of doubt, unbelief, you know, confuse your mind. Am I righteous or not? I am good or not? Because you keep thinking about many mistakes you have made. Just think about what Jesus Christ did for you. He died for all your sins. Not only yesterday's sins, not only today's sins, but even your future sin. What we need to do is to humble ourselves, ask the Lord's forgiveness, and cleanse our heart and make it right before the Lord. Amen. And he said, bring the wood. Before Israel could rebuild the temple, they had to make some preparations. Before we can rebuild, we need to make some preparation. Now, we could apply this to all the planning and programs we intend to do. And the most important tree during that time, in order for, you, for them to use or rebuild the temple, is the cedar tree. The most strongest tree. And the cedar tree is the most common wood. It has been revered for its spiritual significance for thousands of years. Its, its wood was used for the doors of sacred temples and burned in cleansing ceremonies for purification. In the Philippines, one of our greatest wood is Nara. But during that time, to rebuild the temple, what they need is cedar. So the tree was taught to house important gods and to be an entrance to higher realms. It's very important for them. So, when God told them, go up to the mountains, bring woods. So in the Bible, trees are sometimes used figuratively to, rep to represent kingdoms, rulers, and individuals. And that's in the Old Testament perspective. But in the New Te Testament, it's different now. What is the spiritual significance of wood? First, strength. It can stand for centuries. Second, sacrifice. They can stand against all weathers. And third, stability. Used to build and contribute for the future. And the Bible says in Psalms, we are like a tree planted by the rivers of water. In season or out of season, we can flourish. Our leaves will become green. Lives will become more fruitful. You know, the wood speaks about our foundation. In order for us to be ready, in order for us to be prepared, praise God. This is our preparation. Before you can rebuild, you need to prepare. So if prayer is important, the next one is what? The Word of God. Because the Word of God speaks about our strength. It will be impossible for us to face the challenges ahead of us without the Word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word out, that, but, but, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. 
Don't you know the word of God is so powerful, it's so quick. And there are so many Christians today, they neglected the word of God. They thought reading our daily bread is enough for them. Our daily bread is good, but not enough. We need to meditate. We need to put the word of God into our heart and put that word into action. Hallelujah. Amen. Whatever devotional books we are using, I would like to encourage you, return to the word of God. Return. This is our foundation to be ready, to be prepared. We shouldn't consider rebuilding the church until we consult the blueprint, the Bible. There is a cleansing effect from reading and meditating upon the words of the Bible. The cleansing effect. First, we learn to identify our outward areas of weakness in our life. Sometimes, or most of the time, the Bible is like a mirror. And sometimes it hurts us. And we read the Word of God, and the Word of God will say, you, adulterous nation, you, this kind of people. And sometimes if we read that word and put that word into our heart, it hurts us. But it's good. If you will receive it with a humble heart, it will change your life. It will change your life. Don't think, oh, the pastor is singling, he is singling me out. He's, he's, he's pointing the word just for me. No. The word of God is speaking to us. We learn to identify our outward, our outward areas of weakness in our life because all of us are guilty of that. Amen? We, are all, we have our own weakness. And that's why you don't need to confess yourself to other person or that person besides you. Maybe you may say to yourself, <clears throat> maybe I am weaker than this person besides me. I have 10 weaknesses. You have no idea. Maybe he's thinking, I, maybe I'm, I have 15 weaknesses. Or maybe I have 20. The point is we have our own weaknesses. And the word of God is quick and powerful enough to change us. Identify all the weaknesses. That is our outward cleansing effect of God's reading, of God's word reading and meditating. And then the other one is inner cleansing take, takes place in our soul as we meditate upon God's word. So we're not just here to listen and receive the word of God, but also to put the word of God into action. We don't understand how this happens, but our soul is being fed. And nourish and is growing spiritually stronger. We understand the need for physical food. We need to understand also the need for spiritual food. Okay, don't raise your hand. How many of you you eat five times a day? Plus snacks. And then sometimes midnight snacks. Or five minutes before you sleep. Not good exercise. <laughs> And then how many times you eat spiritual food? Three times a day. Most of us, only once. If not in the morning, in the evening. Or maybe if we are in a big trouble. Eat the Word of God. Day in, day out. Morning, lunch, dinner. And if you can do for your uh, snacks, do it. Amen? There is no harm. Eating the word of God two minutes before you sleep. It's a good spiritual appetite. Amen. Bring the wood. That's your preparation. That's the word of God to make you stronger, to make you stable, to sacrifice, to do things for the glory of God. And the third one build the house. The Bible says, build a house and I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified, says the Lord. In other words, build a house means go to work. Now, after seeking the presence of God in your own place, in your own mountain, having that kind of desire to know God more and more, 
Then he will have preparations about the word of God. Now it's time to go to work. Tell to your neighbor, go to work. And then the good thing about us, we are workable people. We are sometimes, maybe not all of us, but many of us are addicts. Working. Workaholic. No? From, from, from sunrise to sunset. <laughs> three jobs, three part-times, two part-times. Well, I'm not talking about that kind of work. We can spend time in commitment and prayer to God and we can spend months or years of preparation, reading the Bible and making plans, but there comes a time when we have to roll up our sleeves and get to work. The Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 17, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. If we are fed enough and, and, and we prayed enough, now it's time to work. Put that into action. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Oh, but if you combine your faith and your work, amen? The prayer, word of God, and your work. Praise God. So the nation of Israel had been neglecting the Lord's work for too long. Because they are concentrated, taking care of their career, taking care of their business, taking care of their houses, without taking care of the house of the Lord. And that's why the Lord has to raise up Haggai to stir up the people from their inaction. Sometimes we need to be stirred up too. Remember, stage one and stage two are what leads us to stage three. And sometimes, we feel we have to become more committed in our prayer. That is our stage one. But what we are really seeking is a perfection of dedication. This will never happen, not in this lifetime. Our commitment to the Lord is made in faith, not in our own ability to perfectly carry it out, but in God's ability to help us keep our commitment to Him in spite of our human frailty. Because we are called by God. Don't you know you are called by God and God lives in you and he loves you no matter how many mistakes you have made and still loving you and still willing to do anything for you? See, when Israel went through the process of rebuilding the temple, they did it in the three progressive stages. First, they climbed to the mountain, then they gathered the lumber, and finally they built the temple. So they had to complete one stage before they could go on to the next stage. So we are limited in what we can do for the Lord. As we spend more time in prayer, we will gain a greater desire to learn the Word of God. We will have that kind of desire, motivation to know more and more and more and more and more about the Word of God. And as we read more from the Scriptures for our preparation, we will have a greater desire to share with others the wonderful blessings that we have experienced from the hand of God. It's time to work. So we're not just going to Put the word of God into our heart. We are going to share the word of God. That's our work. And that's the reason why God placed you in that position. God put you in that place. Whether it's your, that's a school or office, wherever. God position you, place you for a purpose. Not just to earn money. Not just to, to, to build your career. But to be an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's your work. That's your calling. That's your ministry. Amen. And the glory of the house of the Lord will be greater than the former one. And I believe, praise God, the glory will continue to grow and increase if the church of the living God will continue to be ready and be prepared. Do you think we can do that? Our prayer, the word of God, and our work to share the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine the impact. Imagine the impact. I'd like to close in this. There was an old friend who wanted to see his friend. And he said to himself, it's been a while. I haven't seen my friend. So he gave him a call and he said, friend, I miss you a lot. Can I visit you? Oh, yeah. Come this weekend. Let's have fellowship together. 
Okay, I'll be there early in the morning. So the weekend came and the old friend saw his body. They were so excited, you know. They hug and talk stories. But while talking stories, he said that the, the old friend, the visitor, noticed there's so much things outside the house. And he said, my friend, why you have so many things outside the house? What are you doing? Oh, I'm sorry, but, you know, I have to put new wood fences in my place. Oh, I see. You're so busy then. A uh, little bit. Can I help you? Oh, yeah, if you don't mind. So he helped his friend. So putting all new fences. And it took a while. And the friend said, Friend, I'm tired. Can I get some rest? Yeah, let's go inside the living room. And then when they went inside the living room, the old friend saw there are so many things in the living room. It was a mess. And then the friend said, Do you have lots of kids? No. Where are they? They went to the mall. So why this, your living room is like a mess? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, because I'm planning to rearrange everything. Oh my goodness. This is a lot of work. May I help you? Yeah, if you don't mind. So he helped his friend. Putting everything in the right position. And it took a while. Then the friend, the visitor asked again his friend, my friend, I'm hungry. Can we eat? Yeah. Go to my kitchen. You know, I have lots of food in the refrigerator. It's my, all microwavable. Yeah, serve yourself. Oh, my friend. And he went to the kitchen. And he saw the kitchen was also dirty. Hey, friend, your dirty kitchen is really dirty. And it seems that you know, all those dishes in the sink still here and some cockroach, you know, running. It's like having a football game here, you know. Oh, I'm sorry, my friend. I have, I'm supposed to clean it up, but I have to finish everything that I'm doing here. And then a friend said, is it okay if I clean it up this place for you? Yeah, if you don't mind, go ahead. So he cleaned up the whole dirty kitchen to make it clean. Why do you call it dirty kitchen anyway? So, so, the, so he make it clean and, and good and nice, you know. And it took a while. Where's your restroom? A friend said, the, the old friend said, oh, yeah, go straight in the hallway on second door on your lap. That's the restroom. We went to the restroom. So it's dirty. Wow. Dirty. Smells. Oh, stinks. Friend, your restroom stinks. Oh, I'm sorry. It's supposed to, to clean up, but I don't have time yet. Would you mind if I clean it up for you? Yeah, please. And he cleaned up the, 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 the restroom. And it took a while. It almost late afternoon already. Cleaning up here and there. And he said, friend, tired. Can I take some rest? I want to sleep up for a while. Yeah, go upstairs. Take whatever rooms you want, you know, just take some rest. Then he saw a room. He opened it. Went inside. And boom! Wow! Friend, it's not good. It's a mess. I can't sleep. This is not so good. Would you like me to clean up for you? If you don't mind. The friend said, yeah, I'm sorry, friend. Go ahead. Then after that, you can rest. And he cleaned up everything. And the whole day was done cleaning up 
putting everything in order. My friend, God is coming very soon. And he, we are the house of the Lord. He is our Savior and also our friend. We are a friend of God. If we, the church of the Lord, will become more serious in our spiritual life, don't you know, Jesus is very much willing to come and visit us. How are you going to prepare yourself? How are you going to prepare your, your mind, your heart, everything inside of you? Is he going to clean it, clean it up from head to toe? God is waiting for your time. It's good to have a friend like that, willing to clean up everything. But he missed the point, the time of fellowship, the time of being together, the time of having relationship with his old friend. Church, God is not an old friend. He is our Savior. He is our loving God. And he wants to cleanse us. And he wants to have time with us. Let's bow our head.